Welcome to iLecture Online. I remember on the last video I forgot to mention that we're dealing with series RCL circuits. So we're actually dealing with finding the step response of a series RCL circuits and that's important because when we're dealing with parallel RCL circuits of course things are going to be a little bit different. So we're going to learn some more using an example. So here we have a circuit that has two resistors. Here we have a first resistor an inductor and a capacitor. We have a second resistor and a switch. We have a voltage source. Notice at time equals zero the switch opens which isolates this resistor from the rest of the circuit. And now we have the source driving current through the circuit. Now what happens before we open up the circuit? Of course what happens here is that current will flow on the outside branch like this and the voltage will then of course, the capacitor will fill up a charge. There will be a voltage across the capacitor. There will be some initial voltage. When we open the switch, that will be the initial volt voltage. And there will be some initial current through the inductor when the switch is, uh, when the switch is uh, closed. And of course, when the switch opens, that will then become the initial current through the inductor. We're going to do several examples with different values for this R right here because as the value of the R changes we'll then see different reactions in the current and we'll see different kind of, of uh, dampening. Uh, for example when R is large versus small well let's see what happens when the resistance changes. This one is a 1 ohm resistor and it'll state to be a 1 ohm resistor. Notice they want us to find all these various things. They found us to find the steady state voltage. They want us to find the initial voltage, initial current. They want us to find the dv dt when time equals zero and what type of damping we're dealing with. Then there's two more parts to the problem. In part two, we'll actually we'll find the solution to the voltage uh, as a function of time. And then in part three, we'll find out the current in the circuit as a function of time. So first of all, the steady state voltage. What happens when the switch opens and things uh, go on for a while so that the transient period is finished and now what will be the steady state voltage across the capacitor? Notice that when the switch is open long enough and current flows long enough the capacitor will fill up with charge, current will stop in the circuit and the voltage across the capacitor will be equal to the voltage across the source. So we can say that the steady state voltage in this case will be 24 volts. What will be the initial voltage across the capacitor just as we open up the switch? Well, before we open up the switch, current is flowing through here and the voltage across this capacitor will equal the voltage across this resistor. But we have another resistor here and of course the current running through the inductor, if it doesn't change, the inductor doesn't offer any opposition to the current, so it's simply a voltage divider. So we can say then that the initial voltage across capacitor is going to be equal to the voltage across the 1 ohm resistor with respect to the voltage across both resistors. So it would be 1 plus 5 because we're going to set the resistor for the first problem equal to 5 and that will then be multiplied times the voltage of the source. So in this case it's going to be equal to, well I'll write it here, 1 over 6 times 24 volts and so that will be equal to 4 volts. So the initial voltage across capacitor is equal to 4 volts, the steady state voltage is equal to 24 volts. Okay, Now what is the initial current to the circuit? Well when the switch is closed, current will be flowing through here, nothing will flow through the capacitor, the current through the inductor is steady state so there's no opposition to the current, so then we can say that using Ohm's law that I is equal to voltage to the source divided by the total resistance, in this case that would be 24 volts divided by 6 ohms, that's the total resistance, so that's equal to 4 amps. So the initial current, initial current is simply equal to this. So that's how we establish the initial, the initial voltage, initial current, and the steady state voltage. Remember that eventually we'll end up with the voltage as a function of time which is equal to the transient voltage with respect to time plus the steady state voltage with respect to time and this steady state voltage will go in here we just have to find the transient voltage and we'll show you how to do that. So next we need to figure out what type of damping we're dealing with. And in order to do that, we need to find the values for alpha and the values for omega. So, 
the value for alpha that is equal to r over 2l and the value for omega is equal to the square root of 1 over lc. Okay, with the current values that we have here, let's figure out what that is. In the case of alpha, that's equal to r, which is 5, divided by 2 times l. l in this case is equal to 1, and so that's equal to 2.5. For omega sub naught, that is equal to 1 over the square root of l, which is 1, and c in this case is equal to 1 quarter. The square root of one quarter is one half. Bring that to the numerator, we have omega sub naught is equal to two. So in this case, so we have alpha is larger than omega sub naught. So therefore, this is what we call overdamped. As long as alpha is bigger than omega, we have an overdamped case. When alpha is equal to omega, we have a critically damped case. When alpha is smaller than omega, we have an underdamped case. But there's also an interesting way of looking at it. Let's set these equations equal to each other, let's square the both sides. Let's say alpha squared equals to omega sub naught squared. So in a critically damped case, for example, if we set these two equal to each other, we have r squared divided by 4l squared is equal to 1 over l times c. And let's move the l squared over there and the c over there. So we have r squared c over 4 equals L squared over L, or eventually we could say that L is equal to R squared C over 4. So that's in the case of a critical damped case. Critically damped. But when do we have an overdamped case? Well, we have an overdamped case, overdamped case, in case that alpha squared is larger than omega sub naught squared. So when alpha squared is larger than omega sub naught squared, we have an overdamped case. So alpha squared is r squared over 4l squared, greater than omega sub naught, which is 1 over lc. Move the l squared over there, same thing again. We end up with r squared c over 4 greater than l. Or if L is less than r squared c over 4, then we have what we call an overdamped case. So that's kind of different that we had for the source free circuit. When L was bigger, we had an overdamped case, but in this case, when L is smaller. And does that make sense? In other words, the bigger r, the more likely we are to have an overdamped case. In the source free parallel circuit, that wasn't the case, it was the other way around. But here it makes sense, because if R is big, that would make the current small, and the change in the current small. And if the change in the current small, then the inductor would not have a lot of things to do, because it would only be opposing a small change in the current. So if L is small relative to the resistance, we have an overdamped case. In other words, the resistor will be very uh, will be very active in opposing the change in current and it'll be damping the circuit very very quickly If R is small in this case then, then the inductor will have a lot to do because then there'll be a lot of change in the current And so there'll be a lot more oscillation of this of the current before the resistance will pull energy out of the circuit So in this case in a series R cell circuit it does make sense that we have the symbol here in essence reversed relative to the source free circuit. But anyway, the easy way to tell if whether or not we have an overdamped case is to simply compare these two, or we could say if the inductor is small relative to R squared C over 4, then again we have an overdamped case. Okay, finally we want to find dVdt hmm, when time equals zero. So we have a little bit of space here, so let's block off some space. And let's go back to the capacitor. We know that the capacitance, by definition, is equal to Q over V. Put the V over here, we have CV is equal to Q. And now if we take the derivative with respect to time, we have C times dV dt is equal to dQ dt is equal to I. So in other words, we can write that dV dt is equal to I over C. 
n dv dt, when time is equal to zero, is equal to the initial current divided by c. And so here we have a different equation to figure out the initial conditions. In this case, we can take the equation that we're eventually going to find, the voltage with respect to time. If we now take the derivative with that respect to time and set the time equal to zero, that is going to be equal to the initial current divided by the capacitance in the circuit. So if the initial current is known, and did we figure out the initial current right here? Yes, it was known, 4 amps. So in this case, the dvdt would be 4 amps divided by the capacitance. The capacitance is 1 quarter of a farad. 4 divided by 1 quarter is equal to 16. So in this example, that would be equal to 16. Again, why do we need that? In order to find the constants a1, a2 in our equation. So this is the things that we, these are the things that we need to know. We need to figure out how to find the steady state voltage. We need to find out how to find the initial voltage. We need to know how to find the initial current. We need to know what type of system we're dealing with. If it's overdamped, critically damped, or underdamped, we can do that by comparing alpha to omega, or we can do that by comparing L to R squared C over 4. If L is less than R squared C over 4, then we're dealing with an overdamped case. If it's equal, it's a critically damped case. If L is larger, then we're dealing with an underdamped case. And finally, we're supposed to be able to find the derivative of the voltage to respect to time, set time equal to zero, and then we realize that is equal to the initial current divided by the capacitance. Once we know all that, then it's pretty easy to solve the rest of the problem. So let's now go ahead and do that. We'll start part two in the next video, and we'll show you then how to solve the problem once we've got this out of the way. And that is how it's done. <clears throat>